Do you love the words of this book? Welcome to Encore, where we continue the conversation around this book, the Word of God. Ed McNeil here, back with Pastors Jory and Brandon. We're on a continuing series on a man after God's own heart. We're leaning into this series to talk about David, but we're really contrasting the life of David with that of Saul. And we've been focused on Saul, and we're just starting to get into the heart of David. And so three, I think we're three weeks into this. This should be an interesting discussion. Talk to me about what stood out to you about this particular sermon. Well, I, <clears throat> one thing that stuck out to me was uh, over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about how David had this uh, awareness of God when he sinned, right? And so when he sinned, he almost didn't even view it as a sin against other people. He was just concerned with how it affected God. And I think in my mind, I, I've kind of had tunnel vision, like, you know, that that's when David was aware of God, was when he was sinning or when he was repenting. And I really loved that Brett uh, brought us to, um, was it 2 Samuel chapter 6? And David didn't just, he wasn't just aware of God when he was sinning or when he was repenting. He was aware of God at all times, and that included when he was worshiping, when he was praising. He didn't care what other people thought about him when he was dancing with all of his might and when he was playing the instruments with all of his might. All he cared about was how much that pleased God. And so it just kind of made me realize to take a, take a step back and say that David was constantly aware of God in everything that he did, and, and, he, and God's perspective of what was being done was what mattered to him and not man's perspective, both on the good and the bad side of things. Oh, man, you're going to lean in with that at the beginning of this? Well, that part of the message really, really stood out to me. And towards the end, he's like, how'd you do during the worship service? H how much effort did you put into that? And I really try to, once we start singing, try to dial in and try to focus on that. I don't know if you will recall this or not, Jory, but when we had just moved into this building, we weren't in the auditorium yet. We were having a service out here um, and in the foyer. And the worship service was going okay. And Brett just stopped and said, hold up. Everybody stop. Um, everybody dial it up a notch. We're good. Let's worship the Lord. As for the musicians to play a little louder, he said, sing a little louder. He says, guys, that's not going to do it. He stopped us again. Guys, I need you to dial it up yet more. And dialed it up, dialed it up like, will you sing with everything in you? And for, and, uh, for the remainder of that worship service, he was demanding that we just poured it all into it. And at the end, we just kind of like, wow, we just took a deep breath. And he said, that's what a worship service is supposed to be like. And I remember that, but here's, here's where I am on this. It's really weird in this assembly to be hollering amen, screaming and hollering in the back, like, man, amen, like you're moved. You're moved by something that Pastor Brett says, and you're like, you know what? If, if I blurt out loud right now, Oh, he thinks he's really spiritual. He thinks he's really holy. Well, you know what? David wasn't concerned with that. But I'll tell you, all of a sudden you move, you move out of this assembly. I go to, I go to a predominantly black church for a funeral, for relatives' funerals or a, or a wedding, and all of a sudden, I'm not quiet. I'm, I'm, I'm animated. I'm excited. I'm. Uh, uh, next thing I know, I might even be in tears through the worship or through something that's happened because everybody just gets behind it. I'm not saying that's the way it has to be done. What I'm saying is that's the way it's done there, and you just kind of you, you go in. We're a body, and the way this body functions is kind of how everybody functions. You kind of go in line with the with the body that you're joined to, and so... Not saying it's wrong. I'm saying there's times when I want to be more expressive and there's times when I'm asked to preach or teach. That's what I do. I pour more into it. I, and I try to ask that of those that are out there. So, man, you're talking about a point that it's like, you're, he's so, David is so spot on. He's, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you think that makes you spiritual. It, it upset his wife. 
And he didn't, it, he said, so be it. This was, to, this was for God. I don't know that I enter most worship services clearly, intently just focused on that. I think I'm, this is for God, but. Yeah, you know, it's funny you bring it up, and, and this might kind of take us down a little rabbit trail, I'm not sure, but. Um, I wasn't there for the service that you described, but I do kind of remember that time in TBT slash Wildwood, uh, our, our history that Brett was very convicting about, listen, when we come here and we worship, like we are worshiping God and this, sh it should look like that. It should sound like that. Um, and at that time, I also was very close with Justin Vandiver and, and anybody that know that knew Justin, uh, I mean, the dude just had a voice that just bellowed out over everyone else. And I always remember just thinking like, man, like that dude gets it. Like wasn't the prettiest sounding voice. He, he wasn't going to win any, you know, America's Got Talent contest or anything like that. But the dude just poured it all out during the worship service. And between Brett convicting us with the messages and then having, you know, that man of God in my life at the time who was that shining example for me, um, that was just something that was super convicting to me. And, and to this day, when I worship, I, I'm still convicted to, to really just lay it all out there, like you said, and not be concerned about, well, I'm, you know, this is the person next to me, like, do they think I sound stupid or am I being too loud for them? You know, I, I try not to focus on those things because of that. Man, uh, very timely. You don't realize how timely it is. September 26th is the message. That's the Sunday sermon we're reflecting on. T September 26th is the six year anniversary of Justin's passing, was this past Sunday. And um, I spent quite a bit of time over the weekend just reflecting on what it was to have him around. And yes, he just had a voice, a commanding voice. And then there are certain worship songs, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. I'm, I am forever connecting that song to Justin. I'm connecting it to being in Hungary and singing that over there. That, that first, it's the second year that everyone else went, but it was the first year that I went, uh, went to Hungary. I can't. I can't get it out of my mind. When I hear blessed be the name of the Lord, I think of that. And I think of something else we used to do during the worship services. Right before we um, did the last song of worship or got into it, we did a scripture reading and I used to read passages of scripture. I've collected a lot of passages um, in order to, for depending on the worship song, I had two or three passages. And so I had about 40 pages worth. Of, um, of different verses and passages that I could read along in, as we got, gave entryway into a worship song. And so this week, thinking about loving the words of God, I, I pulled up some of those for the first time in a, probably in a couple of years. So man, very, very timely. Brandon, so you weren't here during that time, but it's okay because you get to bring in a unique perspective on what, what stood out to you about this message. Yeah, it's interesting, the, the, the worshiping. I think Brett had mentioned, there is no public worship without private worship, was a quote that Brett had mentioned. And he said that in the past before. And this week, it actually hit me really in a different way. Um, you know, I, I was struggling last week. Last week was just a bad week for me, like just in life, right? I, I had a lot of things I was working through at work and with my family and um, just kind of feel, feeling a little beat down. Uh, Sunday morning at <clears throat> 7 a.m. our time, uh, a handful of us met online with uh, Eric and Lacey Brown over in Belfast uh, for a time of prayer. And Eric, uh, he says, okay, you guys hear too much about me every week after week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask what's going on in your guys' life. Give me some praises that's going on in your life. And, uh, you know, there's about six boxes on the Zoom call. And uh, my box just kept quiet the whole time and I'm just thinking why why have I not I just can't dig out the thing that God's doing in my life for the last week like what is up with that it was the first time in the week that I've actually had a, a chance to reflect of what am I doing with God mm. this this last week wow I'm so busy and and last week we in this in this seat we talked about not sacrificing it's obedience that he wants not to sacrifice and uh, <clears throat> I, I look back at the week and I'm like man it was a convicting prayer session in the morning, right off the bat on Sunday. Then we come into worship, and that conviction actually carried me all the way into the service. Mm -hmm. In the worship for me, as opposed to being 
you know, overwhelming or bringing a remembrance of, of things and verses. It was painful for me, the, the worship time. And uh, I, I couldn't sing a lot of it. Um, I think we sung How Great Thou Art was one of the, one of the hymns we sung. And <clears throat> I've spent this last week or this days since. I've listened to that about 10 times in the car, and I've actually sung it out strangely. I don't sing in, I don't sing in the car by myself. But on the way to work or from work, <clears throat> that song, that hymn has had a, it's been healing for me from the painful worship that I had on Sunday. And then the message hit, and it was, it was uplifting uh, and reminding, and it kindled something in me to say, listen, I know why I've had a bad week, and it was convicting. I know why that it was a painful time of worship. It's because my, my private worship time all week, and my public worship wasn't, you know, hollering and jumping and, 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 and you know, crying and amen and <clears throat> like you said, you know, when yes. you go to some other church. Um, black church. A black church that you went to. <laughs> but it, for me, it was, I was, I was <clears throat> internally worshiping God, and there, there is no public worship without private worship. And my internal worship during that, during that time was really meaningful, though I didn't sing out publicly. Mm -hmm. and, and though it wasn't joyous or joyful, <clears throat> It was healing, though, for, to, to worship together and to hear the song and to hear the music. And, and it reminds me of David just sitting out in the, in the hills. I think we were reading through Psalm 19, I think what it was. <clears throat> and it was day after day and night after night, and he's looking at the stars, and he's seeing God in everything. And he's sitting out with the sheep and nobody else, and he's got his little harp, and he's got a song, and he's got, he's got the law of the Lord. And he's, he's deeply in love with the words of God. And so this week I recommitted. <clears throat> having a season of being set apart for the book. Um, we all have these seasons in our life where, we're, where we have set apart our lives to be dedicated to the book in a hard way. And I just, though I haven't, I mean, my, the Bible's not collecting dust for me. Right. I need to get back into loving the Word of God deeply. And so it actually sent me into a devotional shift with my kids and uh, we're starting to memorize Psalm 119. And uh, the encouraging part of that is after day one, my, my nine-year-old had, had all four verses memorized that we went through in our devotions on Monday. And uh, today, this morning on the way to school, my oldest daughter, she had all four done. My son, uh, he's got some work. <laughs> but he had two memorized on the way home from practice uh, today. And... Uh, your message tonight, actually, on the life of Moses and a little plug for the life of Moses. Man, what a, what a good series this is going to be. I know it. And tonight, just a reminder of training our kids. What are we training our kids to do? And uh, me having a bad week leaked into my family. And <clears throat> some of the struggle that my family was having was because of that, because of my week. And uh, it, it, this week now, since Monday, complete different mindset and, and uh, environment at my house. And it's because the book's a central piece of my family this week, and, and we've opened it, and we're studying it differently to fall in love with the actual words um, in Psalm 118. So. Man, that's, uh, that's I, I feel like I say this a lot. That's a really powerful response. I use the word powerful a lot. But when we're dealing with the Word of God, I mean, it just has this commanding impact on our life, and that impact comes out in power. What I think is happening is we're, we're talking about this and what happens is each of us serve in leadership capacities in this church. And then in addition to that, we have other responsibilities. We're, we're pursuing degrees, working towards schooling, getting equipped for ministry. All of these things are happening and we have a family. <laughs> and and all, that, all that happens and listen, it's not we're neglecting the Word of God. We're reading the Word of God. We're studying. We're praying. We're, we're, we're trying to spend time in worship. But listen, that here I am talking the, uh, about Moses' childhood in a parent's perspective. And the thing that has been on my mind most recently is I've got to dial up in that area. And so hearing you this past week saying, hey, we just kind of doubled down on some things with the kids. That's where I am. That's where I am. I'm like, I'm pouring so much into other ministry things and I know it's happening 
it's like, hey, I've got to really, and I had a couple, I had a conversation with my kids this morning about what they're reading, and, but I, I need to dial back. And, and what you had to share is what I needed to hear. And so it is, it's always great to open the Word of God. It's not going to return void. We didn't, we're thinking, hey, we're coming into the third week on this series and we're using the same passages week after week. And we've kind of touched on a number of things. But I think this, la this last week and this week, we've really hit some personal examples of what's going on in our lives. We're, listen, we're not perfect beings. And listen, and, and everybody knows that, but they're also expecting from a leadership perspective, well, what time do you do your devotions every day? They're not happening every day, folks. They're, they don't happen every day in my household. And so uh, th that's one of those things that, man, I've got to dial in. There are some days it can't happen because I leave early and I come home after they're in bed. There are some days during the week, and that's how crazy our schedules get. But listen, that just means, hey, when we're together, let's take a few moments. And I'm not talking, we're not talking about a lot of time. We're just talking about, I, I think the goal is, coming off of a message like the one we just heard, is we can't make our kids fall in love with this book, but we can certainly influence them towards that. We, we, we can certainly get them to see that we're in love with this book. It's, it's the same kind of passion that you, you hope your kids see that you and your wife's relationship is so healthy and you're always doting on one another and so excited to be around one another that it's, it ought to be a natural result that they seek that same kind of relationship. It's so healthy. Well, that same thing needs to take place with this. And so, man, this is a healthy conversation. This really isn't about a viewer. It's not about, um, um, it is about edifying the church, but the truth of the matter is, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're just edifying each other. And so I appreciate what you shared. What else, guys? <clears throat> I'm just going to say uh, I appreciate kind of what both of you said on that one. So I, I love it, uh, Brandon, that you turned to Psalm 119. Um, and in, in preparing for this encore, I kind of was going, um, you know, We've kind of come full circle on David, right, in the Sunday morning and talking about a man after God's own heart. Well, what is the thing that makes him a man after God's own heart? It's that his heart is filled, literally filled to the brim with God's words, right? And uh, one of the things, like Brett brought up in Psalm 119, 119, right, 176 verses, 174 of them, David is talking about God's word. But not just David is talking about God's word. He's uniquely talking about a different aspect, a different perspective of God's word 174 times. That is convicting. I don't know if I could come up with 10 unique things to say about God's Word, right? And so when you, when you get to Revelation and you find out about this thing called the key of David, well, the key of David is not just spending time in the Bible. It's not just memorizing Bible even. I mean, the Pharisees had to memorize the first five books word for word and be able to write it out, right? Did that mean that they had a love for God? No, like it's, it's the love for God's Word. That is why David had his Word hidden in his heart was because he first learned to love the Word. And, you know, like you just said, Ed, I mean, it's not necessarily having devotions every day at a prescribed time and forcing someone to memorize a verse, but showing them how loving God's Word is playing out in your life and influencing them in that matter. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, how do, do you have to, hey, look at how I'm loving your mother. You don't say that. You don't do that. It's just, that's caught. That's caught. It's not taught. And so, yes, we do want to teach lessons, but as we're teaching the lessons, they say, man, how, how come he's always so excited about this book? How come every time I look, my dad's studying this book. How come every chance he gets, he's talking about this book? How come he devotes so much time to this book? Maybe I ought to look into this. Maybe I ought to get into it just a little bit more. There's something absolutely amazing about falling in love with this book. And one of the things that we, we do is we, we point to the people in our lives that we know beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt love this book. And we admire them for it. And the, the thing that we, I guess, as fathers and as husbands is hopefully our household sees that in us. And so that's an exciting thing. I want to do something a little bit different. We're moving towards the close of this. What I did was I picked up 
um, all of these passages. Like I said, I had over 40 pages worth of collections of verses that I could use in anticipation of that last worship song. So to set the stage, what we used to do is our pianist would play whatever the song was we were getting ready to do, and I would read two or three passages of Scripture, and then everybody would stand and we would sing it. And those passages were meant to just get us in the mind frame, in the mindset before we sang. What I did was I just started looking over there and I said, you know what, let me pull out two or three passages, just collections of seven or eight verses or whatever that really stood out to me. I said, oh, I like this one. I pulled off a, I pulled off a passage. Oh man, I've got to pull this one in here. I usually print off two or three pages worth just of, of a couple of verses to have, but not today. I have six pages of verses because I started on this plot of, man, what are some great verses or passages from Scripture? Now, I have an unfair advantage, but, and, and so maybe I lead off with this, but think about a passage, a collection of verses that really speak to you and that, man, they're, they're just powerful. When you think of a powerful passage, it's th that's what comes to mind. And it can be a verse that we've, we've looked at in the past couple of weeks. But let's all grab a passage and let's just all share from God's Word. And listen, because I have one, I'll lead off. And um, so you guys just don't even worry about um, dialing in on what I'm doing. I want you to dial in on what you're doing. And I'll read this for the viewers. I'll pick one of these out, which is going to be hard enough to do. But I'll start with one, and then we'll, we'll see where you are, if you've got a passage or something that's, that's speaking to you, and maybe it's something right in line with what we've been discussing, but it doesn't even have to be that. <clears throat> I'll just read this one. How about, we're talking about child rearing and raising children. The end of this speaks well of parenting. I'm in Psalm 113, and it says this, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. He lifteth and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. And I love this. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Is there a passage that grabbed either of you at this time? If, if you're still looking, I'll read another one. Read one more, because I'll I read one more. Yeah, get to a get to a passage. Let me read another one. In our Wednesday night studies, we're doing the life of Moses. I'm in Exodus chapter 15. After the Red Sea crossing, they sing a song of Moses, and then I'll just read a couple of verses, starting in verse 11 of Exodus 15. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hath led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in, the, in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Palestine. The dukes, then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold of the, upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Gentlemen. I've got uh, Psalm 66, verses 13 through 20. Um, and it's just interesting to me how God doesn't just hear 
our prayers. But at the end of this, see if you can catch it. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips, lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats, Selah. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. He doesn't just hear it. He attends to it. And I think of uh, like, a, like a server at a restaurant attending to our table, mm -hmm. getting what we need, and, 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 and get, all of our wants are met. And, and he doesn't just hear our prayers, but he attends to them. And, it's, just, and it's, it's actually mentioned this way in several different passages is why I wanted to land on this one. But uh, that the Lord would attend to our prayers just seems so amazing to me. Man, and that so, is. That is. Thank you for sharing that perspective on it. <clears throat> so, I, you know, of course, in typical Ed fashion, we get no warning. We're just supposed to pick out our favorite Bible verse, you know, whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I chose uh, to go with a, a passage that just in the past year has meant a lot uh, to me and my family. Um, so I'm in Hebrews 12. So I'm starting in verse 1. Uh, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I mean, for obvious reasons, I think that's just an, when you say powerful passage, I think that's an extremely powerful passage um, just to think about, to remind yourself what Jesus Christ went through for us and, and to remind yourself that there's an entire spiritual world out there watching and on the sidelines of this race that we're running. Uh, and just that powerful imagery of being a participant, a participant in this race and just the reminder to, to stick with it and to, to focus on our author, the author of our salvation. Just powerful. The author and finisher of our faith has the ultimate say, and it looks like you've turned to a. Have you turned to another passage? Are you ready to read oh, something okay. as we conclude? Okay. I, there is a there is a passage in Acts where the gospel gets turned over to to or comes to the Gentiles, and that passage. I wish I, I wish it was Acts 18. It isn't. <laughs> um, but it just is so meaningful. I've highlighted it in a couple of my different Bibles. Just. That the, that the gospel was, was turned over or, or came then unto the Gentiles. What a blessing for us as Gentiles yeah. that, that that verse is in there, that, that now they can come to us with the, with the saving power of the gospel. It's a very, very cool thing to think all the way through. Yeah, First Thessalonians 2, 4, but we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Let me ask you the question I started with. Do you love the words? of this book.